Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Upscaling Solutions, Expanding Access to Irrigation for Smallholders in Sub-Saharan Africa, part one. Um, I would like to do the introductions. We will have an overview by Timothy Williams, Director for Africa, the International Water Management Institute in Accra, Ghana. Following is Joseph Anagbila, Human Development Coordinator for the Catholic Diocese of Narongo Baltaganga, is that even close? <laughs> Ghana. Rich Birkeland, President of Market Development, Global Irrigation Division of Valmont Industries. Martin Fisher, the co-founder and chief executive officer for Kickstart International. Meredith Giordano, principal researcher and US representative for the International Water Management Institute. Ruth Meinzendick, senior research fellow, International Food Policy Research Institute. Tembi Mwambakamba, Climate Smart Agriculture Program Manager with Fannerpan, and Tim Pruitt, Chief Executive Officer with IDE. Thank you, Molly. Good afternoon, and welcome to this session on upscaling solutions and expanding access to irrigation for smallholder farmers in Sub-Saharan Africa. My name is Timothy Williams. I work at the International Water Management Institute as a director for Africa. I'm based in Accra in Ghana, but provides oversight for IMI's activities in four offices in Africa. Uh, the office in Accra in Ghana, the one in Pretoria in South Africa for the Southern Africa Development Community region the office in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia for the Nile Basin and East Africa, and our office in Cairo, Egypt for the Middle East and North Africa. This afternoon we are tasked with looking at what will be the ways to expand access to irrigation for millions of small oil farmers in Africa. In Sub-Saharan Africa, about 70% of the 400 million or so people that live in rural area are smallholder farmers. Smallholder agriculture on the continent relies mostly on rainfall. So it is rain-fed agriculture. And because of increasing variability in rainfall, partly due to climate change, and other factors, reliance on rainfed agriculture is becoming too precarious to sustain livelihoods and to provide income for the millions of small older farmers. Switching from a rainfed landscape to an irrigated landscape provides an opportunity not only to allow small oil farmers to feed themselves, but also to provide an opportunity to feed the continent and also provide exports to uh, other countries, both regionally as well as uh, beyond. We all know, and the talk given before uh, this one during the lunch break should quite clearly the advantages of reliable irrigation in Africa. It allows for improved crop yields. It allows for multiple cropping systems. It allows for diversification as well as intensification of farming systems in such a way that can be a game changer in the African continent. But having reliable and sustainable irrigation systems demands scientific knowledge, it demands uh, tools as well as technical solutions, but more also importantly, it demands uh, social and institutional solutions that can allow smallholder farmers not only to be able to gain access to water, but also to the necessary inputs needed to be able to increase production and productivity. But these are the main bottlenecks to expansion of 
irrigated agriculture in, 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 in sub-Saharan Africa. Africa is the least irrigated continent in the world, and only about 5% of cultivated land is presently irrigated. So there is a huge potential if irrigation can be expanded because it will provide an insurance against uh, climate change and variability due to uh, late onset of rainfall, but also provide an important uh, <coughs> lifeline to uh, farmers as well as the young men and women in the rural sector. Um, over the last few years and months, we've seen on television worldwide the huge migration of young people from rural areas to cities in, uh, in country as well as abroad overseas. And when one looks at the potential for irrigation to provide employment for young people, it also creates an opportunity to be more commercially oriented in agriculture. And for those who are not directly interested in farming, it can provide non-farm opportunity for them in equipment repair, in irrigation service provision, that can then together provide uh, an expanded base for transformation in the rural economy in Africa. The International Water Management Institute, as well as many of the partners uh, sitting here, have been engaged in looking at how small-scale irrigation systems can be expanded in Africa. The advantage of focusing on small-scale irrigation for small holders is twofold. One, small older farmers constitute the majority of farmers in Africa. They farm by far a larger area of land than what you find on the large-scale schemes in Africa. And because they also produce more food than what you obtain from large-scale uh, irrigation systems or even from commercial farming, they represent a constituency that if properly managed and encouraged can bring about uh, improved livelihoods uh, in the continent. And this afternoon, we want to explore the various solutions that have been developed to help small-scale farmers to do better. Over the years, uh, and in various projects conducted and undertaken by EMI and its partners, we've achieved uh, success in promoting uh, pump irrigation in Africa, looking at individually owned pumps powered by various means, hydrocarbon, whether gasoline or diesel fuel, or at times electricity, but also increasingly we're looking at solar-powered irrigation systems for small older farmers given the um, sunshine that is perennial uh, in Africa. And this represents also an important technology change in that we are using sustainable energy to be able to uh, draw water, lift water for increased uh, uh, irrigation. As I said earlier on, in order to transform the rain-fed landscape to an irrigated landscape, there are a number of measures that will need to be in place. First of all, land tenure remains a very big problem that prevents access of the a, a, a <coughs> segment of farmers, especially women and young people, from gaining access to irrigation. So land tenure is one issue that would need to be addressed in trying to upscale smallholder irrigation. Next to um, the issue of land and access to water is the issue of access to inputs. The irrigation equipment needed to be able to expand area under irrigation is not affordable to many smallholder farmers. The upfront investment cost implied in being able to acquire a pump and the uh, complementary 
irrigation equipment is beyond the means of many farmers. So having the access to uh, credit and loans to enable them to be able to offset the huge upfront investment cost is also an important element. The other aspect is being able to have access to markets. For most farmers, the sustainability of irrigation depends on being able to make a profitable enterprise out of irrigated agriculture. It's just not only for growing staple food crops, but also being able to use irrigation to be able to um, get into cash crops that can provide income for other household expenses, for children's education, for health care, and, and, and all that. Also needed is uh, access to extension advisory services. Because the culture in Africa is mostly rain-fed agriculture culture, there is a death of expert advice on irrigated agriculture. And part of the work that uh, my institute and others have been doing is to be able to improve uh, irrigation literacy. What are the good practices the farmers need to adopt when they irrigate so they are not over-irrigating or under-irrigating? And some of the technologies mentioned by uh, <clears throat> Rob uh, this afternoon, the watching front detectors are very simple electronic gadgets that can tell a farmer when the soil is too dry and it needs to irrigate or she needs to irrigate and when the, wet, the soil is too wet and you need to abstain from irrigation for a few days to be able to ensure that uh, they're making the most effective and efficient use of water. And lastly is also government policy. In most cases, because of government taxation policies and uh, other measures put in place, they constitute a bottleneck to wider adoption of irrigation equipment and, uh, and kits. And having the right policy to provide the enabling environment and incentives to farmers to be able to adopt and sustainably utilize this equipment is also a necessary uh, step. The Guardian newspaper of the United Kingdom um, in 2013 published an article looking at the potential of small-scale irrigation in Africa. And the conclusion is that the promotion of small-scale irrigation can actually help small older farmers in Africa to be able to increase their output fivefold within a very short period of time. And in, an, in a continent where food insecurity and poverty is still largely prevalent, that will be a tremendous change by allowing the ample water resources available as well as the under, underutilized land to be uh, put effectively on the irrigation. And this afternoon, we want to explore farmer-led innovations in smallholder irrigation that is already going on. We also want to look at private-led, private sector-led investment in irrigation uh, in Africa because there are different categories of investors uh, in the irrigation sector in Africa. The, by far, the largest single constituent uh, of investors are farmers themselves. On their own, using their own resources, they've managed to be able to innovate at a rate that is much, much faster than what you find on the public irrigation systems in Africa. They, either individually or as a group, join together to buy pumps that they manage or in some cases, center pivot systems that will allow them to be able to achieve economies of scale in producing and in bulk purchasing inputs for their firms. There are also private sector investors who see, a pro uh, driven by a profit mo motive, 
see the opportunity of organizing contract farming or art grower systems, bringing in farmers to be able to um, engage them in irrigated agriculture. There are also non-governmental organizations, and we have represented in the panel here and case study presenters, uh, some at the forefront of introducing innovation into small-scale irrigation in Africa, kickstart, and uh, as well as faith-based organizations, like the Catholic uh, Mission in Ghana that is helping smallholder farmers to be able to get uh, on the irrigation ladder in uh, northern Ghana. Also, we have international financial institutions uh, like the World Bank, the African Development Bank, as well as smaller sub-regional banks that are also funding irrigation. Partly out of their experience of looking at the, the what I call what I will describe as a failure of large-scale irrigation systems in Africa, and seeing the potential in actually looking at the opportunity presented by small-scale irrigation. And the international financial institutions are putting in large sums of money into irrigation. And of course, they are looking at irrigation from a wide spectrum and looking at the entire continuum of irrigation systems in, in, in Africa. And I think uh, part of the discussion later on in the second segment of this presentation will look at the, the synergy that can be developed when we consider the entire spectrum of irrigation systems uh, in, in Africa. So what are we hoping to achieve from uh, the discussion this afternoon? First, we would like to highlight successful case studies of small, small older irrigations. And I have here seven colleagues that will talk and uh, provide examples of different successful lessons of small-scale irrigation in Africa. And um, I also see the, <clears throat> and they come from a range of background. As I mentioned earlier on, we, we have faith-based uh, organizations we have social enterprise organizations uh, like IDE that team uh, represents. Uh, Martin represents a non-governmental organization. And we have also an international US-based organization that works in Africa that will provide uh, examples of their work, as well as my colleagues uh, from uh, the research uh, constituents, uh, Meredith and Ruth, as well as be from a regional organization in South Africa. After listening to their presentations, we then want to be able to, through questions, uh, Q&A, as well as other presentations, be able to answer three basic questions. How can we, first of all, as an overarching uh, uh, topic for our discussion, what we want to look at is how can public and private sector investments be able to support what is going on now, the farmer-led innovation, in order to allow us to be able to scale out what is happening in very small localized uh, regions across Africa. But in doing that, we also want to benefit from the experience of my colleagues here to ask questions about what are the approaches and processes that have made these case studies successful? Because if we can distill the lessons and look at what approaches and processes have made things to work, then we are the first solution to be able to scale out these practices. The second question is, what are the remaining challenges that would need to be addressed in order to be able to move from individual small-scale projects to a larger program that will allow us to be able to uh, gain from expanding these lessons. And finally, what are the new remaining things we need to take into consideration? Do we need to put in place additional policies 
do we need to advise governments on what to do in terms of facilitating the process that is going on? Are there unresolved research and knowledge gaps that we can address in order to be able to move forward? And um, I believe that looking at this set of issues, we will be able to come at the end of it all with a collated publication, a white paper, so to speak, that will allow us to be able to um, have a basis for providing advice to uh, the relevant authorities in Africa, as well as the development investors and international financial institutions on how to better manage the small older, small scale irrigation revolution in Africa. Thank you very much. And this is uh, setting the scene for what our discussion this afternoon will cover. And may I now call on the first case study presenter, Joseph Ayabila from Ghana to give us uh, his presentation. My name is Joseph Ayembila, working for the Catholic Development Office, Nabrungo Borgatanga Diocese. And uh, I'm grateful for being one of the persons to come here and make a case study a presentation for this afternoon sharing. So thank the organizer for that. The summary of the presentation that I'm making this afternoon has to do with a project that the Catholic Church supported in 2003. And by 2012, we had handed over the project to the beneficiary farmers. And uh, looking at uh, the project, we had supported them with the money in Ghana cities that you can see there, 148,980 US dollar equivalent. And that was an upfront investment made by the church based on the need of the local community because the community was faced with famine and hunger for a long time. So the best way was to help them to be productive and stay uh, in business. The contribution of the farmers also had to do with land and their labor in the construction. And as you could see, the returns from the, uh, the, the investment that we will make per hectare that you can see is about $3,263 uh, per hectare that we had to make. And the land uh, that the small earth dam can irrigate is 30 hectare in terms of uh, the reservoir, uh, the water volume that is there. Then we had, uh, in terms of trying to also look at the analysis. We had 150 farmers for onion farming, besides other vegetables that the people cultivate. The DICE has a policy of 40% gender consideration for women. So you will see that we also have women participating in the uh, cultivation of onion and other vegetables in the area. Look at the benefit cost analysis that we did try to uh, stretch it over eight years period, we had a 3.5, we, we saw that it's, a very, it's very high and the project is a, a viable one. This slide gives us the details of the dam or the reservoir that was provided in the 2003, with the, the length of it being 665 meters with 150 meters high. But the important thing is the 472,123 cubic capacity in terms of volume with a reservoir uh, catchment area of 120 uh, hectare land. Now, what actually brought about this issue is also look at the capacity building. Besides the technical aspect, the church took up seriously to build the capacity of the farmers to be able to manage the system. Then we also 
did what we call animation for two years before the construction, because we realized that in the region, over 240 air dams have been put in place, and within a short period, they are silted up, and then there's a need for repairs. So the church thought that, no, let's train these people, spend time to let them understand it. So two years of animation for them to understand how to manage the system. And also help them to mobilize local resources uh, within their own community to manage the systems. The factors that contributed to the success of this project that I'm sharing this uh, afternoon is that we had a clear demand from the community. It was not a top-down approach. They demanded for it. Then we went out and did the feasibility studies and realized that there was a need to support them. And also, we thought that the best thing is to do direct investment, look at the poverty level of the area so that it can kickstart their uh, source of livelihood. Then we supported them in the capacity building to construct this dam, manage it. So within the day of construction to the handover, the people have been involved. And so they engage with the contractors and the engineers, asking questions here and there to understand the system. Then we realized that as we will exit, we already had an exit plan in mind. So Water Users Association was put in place, so they had put bad laws in terms of management of the dam by the community. Then we realized that we need to take a back seat after we have done that and let them lead the process. Despite the success stories in terms of leading them to take over ownership and manage, we also have some hindering factors that inhibited the project. But in the process, I'll tell you how they overcame that by themselves. The, the poor and uh, the design nature, we don't have qualified engineers who could even design it properly. So there were defects right from the early days of the dam. Then the high maintenance cost of this dam also, also uh, confronted farmers because they started making money. And the money had to be channeled through their livelihood uh, needs instead of accumulating it for immediate maintenance. Then we realized that also this leadership that we have put in place, some of them have uh, tried to also misappropriate the resources because they have to manage the bank account and then do proper accountability, but yet this misappropriation occurred. And the last two bullet points are critical in terms of the dam uh, this in the, uh, uh, future. The agriculture input support and access to good seed became a challenge. So they have to grow in traditional crops, and that takes long period, as we also know, and then demand more water. Poor market access and prices also affected the dam in terms of uh, what they're doing. But currently, as we hand over, what happened? We have not left them, but we'll try to do what we call a periodic follow-up to see the success, whether the community is doing well. So we hand over 2012, as I said earlier, but the community members continue to manage these dams through their own systems and structures that were built and the capacity we, we gave them. Through that, they have engaged with the decentralized department, that is the district assembly, to access money to fence the dam because of animals that go on to graze, and so most women could not even farm. But when they access support from the district assembly and fence the dam, it increased the number of women who could do farming in the irrigable area. Then, in terms of the defects on the dam wall, they also had support from the district assembly to repair that. So that tells us how strong the community had become that without us, they are able to access support to maintain the dam as it is now. Yes, I want to also say that with this success story, there is the possibility to scale up the innovation. Because one approach is the participatory approach that we have used from the beginning of the feasibility study to the construction of the dam. Then we also promoted an integrated approach in terms of the dam, uh, uh, the community around. We supported women with microcredit. We supported the men also in terms of small ruminants to be able to raise soil manure to uh, use it for organic farming instead of depending on fertilizer. Because if they have to buy fertilizer, that would mean they have to increase also their investment. So sustainable land use, so we have to look at livestock integration in that. Then we have functional money literacy because most of the women who are making money 
how would they manage this money? How would they identify this money when they go to a bank to deposit the money and take so people don't cheat them? So we have to train the women in money literacy. Training also was, I have already mentioned that, uh, in terms of the group formation to strengthen that. The processes that we took also was the intensive the animation. We had this opportunity in Burkina Faso, which is about two hours drive from our region to that place, that when you spend time to animate the community, you empower them to take ownership. And so we learned them from that experience from Burkina Faso, who took the animation seriously to mobilize the people. The partnership in this regard had to do with the Minister of Food and Agriculture, that's the traditional uh, uh, ministry in Ghana responsible for agriculture. Besides working on the district assembly, Ghana Red Cross, we did partnership with them, and that has been very successful. Look at the scalability aspect in terms of bottlenecks. Technically, we think that the lack of knowledge and skills and the maintenance of the dam by the community, which actually technically we as a diocese could not also provide uh, because we don't have many research institutions around. So we think that the lack of knowledge and skills in the periodic maintenance of the outlet and inlet, inlet valves systems because it's using gravity. Then we also have financial, insufficient financial support in terms of uh, in the energy that they make, they invest it so that in, when they were taking one meal a day, now they can take two meals a day. And currently, if you go to a community now, no farmer goes to the bed without food. So already they are meeting the sustainable development goal too. Then we also had this issue of institutional uh, issues of looking at the, our absence, what happened? In our absence, what happened? So there's a need also that the way, the, a, period, a training be done Follow up by government or the recognized institution. Because as a church, we cannot stay permanently with the people. So it follow up training ought to be done for the management teams, the communities. So what do we need to do in terms of waiting? Efficient water use. My time is up. I will just uh, summarize now. Efficient water use for crop production is one of the areas we recommend for uh, research and then also look at innovative financing. And then when it comes to technology, we talk of application of the good agronomic practices and partnership within business uh, uh, enterprises to invest in the area so that they take farming as business and that will catapult them into a high end source. So to conclude, I want to say that if we have to do this project again as a church, we want to enter into serious contract with the farmers so that the farmers can use this dam year round instead of using it only for uh, the dry season period, which is eight months. Because the, in our system, the landowners use the, 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 the land during the rain, rainy season, and then the, uh, the irrigators go back only in the dry season. So we think that we need to do a proper arrangement. Then we need to have a contract agreement with the Minister of Food and Agriculture to take over the extension delivery and then we we'll also will do more thorough business opportunity analysis for the various crops because I've used Ole Onion to give you the example that gives us the benefit cost ratio of 3.5. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph, for that interesting uh, presentation. I think um, this presentation brings out clearly the connections between various uh, issues. You mentioned the issue of land tenure. Uh, the landowners, um, on the, the land on which the dam was constructed was privately owned, and the farmers who owned the land reserved the use of the land for themselves during the rainy season, and it's only in the dry season that they open it up to the community to use. And then the issue of technical uh, advisory services needed to allow the farmers to be able to maintain the dams, service uh, the infrastructure is also an important element. So also the support that is required from the ministry to be able to allow them to be able to continue to successfully irrigate the land. So uh, let me now call on Richard, Vice President of Market Development and Global Irrigation Division of Valmont Industries. 
Good afternoon. Uh, like Tim said, my name is Richard Birkeland, and after 40-some plus years of uh, participating in conventional irrigation market, I'm trying to retire from Valmont Irrigation. Uh, 30 of those years were spent in kicking a lot of dirt in Africa. So my presentation isn't really a case study. It's an introduction of an unconventional approach to smallholder irrigation in Africa. There. Um, this is a pretty old picture. It's over 20 years old, but I love this picture. Uh, first of all, it was the first pivot I sold in Kenya. And second of all, it was the first interchange I had with a customer on email. And this customer was an Israeli who had um, moved to Kenya, and he was trying to grow export vegetables in the Rift Valley. The Rift Valley in Kenya is right on the equator, and it's at about 6,000 foot elevation. So every day is the same. It's like Groundhog Day every day. Uh, he had a, his, his first question to me was, can you grow vegetables under a pivot? And so I sent him an email back and I said, if it grows under rain, it'll grow under a pivot. <laughs> and then we started an interchange. He said he had this big idea since he had a perfect climate. He wanted to put a pivot in and plant a piece of pie every week and harvest fresh vegetables every day and ship them to Europe as fresh vegetables by air freight. And so we sold him a pivot, we delivered it, and uh, about six months later he said, you have to come to Kenya, you have to see this. So he took me up in this old Cessna, which I think was older than me, and this was before drones, and I took a picture of his pivot out the window, and I said, wow, this is a revolutionary idea. But it wasn't because of his planting. What I saw was many farmers under one pivot because I had wasted a lot of years trying to design small pivots for small farmers. And uh, I'll see why, I'll, I'll show you later why that failed. First of all, I gotta give you a pivot 101 because I think there's some people in the audience here that didn't grow up in Nebraska where you'll pass a pivot about every day. Uh, they're made up in modules, and you can put up to 20 of these spans, and you could irrigate maybe 200, 300 hectares if you wanted to. So you can have one span to 25 spans. So you can fit a pivot into any field. Now, here is why it's so favored by big commercial farmers. It's a simple equation, pi r squared. And uh, if you look at the pivot right here, that's the R in the equation. So it's the only irrigation that takes advantage of an exponential decrease in cost per hectare. If you look at, wrong one here. If you look at this span here, and you look at this span here, both those spans cost the same amount of money. But the last span will irrigate 20 times more land than that first span. And that's why we always failed trying to make small pivots for small farmers. So we had to completely rethink how we were gonna approach the small market. This is a, to show you how important this is, this is a typical pivot installation, and it shows you the cost per hectare depending on the size of the pivot. So the, uh, the small pivots are right here, and the regular pivots are right here. If you fly over to Nebraska, all the pivots are this size. Four pivots fit into a square mile just perfectly. Now, 
like I said, about 30 years of my life has been spent in Africa. And uh, we've been pretty successful there. And it's a pretty easy sale to big commercial farmers. Now, a big commercial farmer in Africa is different than a big commercial farmer in the United States. It's all relative. But as you can see, pivots are not new to Africa. There's over 35,000 pivots installed in Africa. Now, two-thirds of those are in South Africa, where we first introduced the, uh, the technology in the middle of 70s. But again, if you look at Egypt and Sudan, there's a lot of pivots in Africa. And because of that, we've had to develop a technical service network with, all through Africa to support these commercial farmers. So why not leverage that technical support for smallholders? This slide shows you the amount of water in Africa, both groundwater and surface water. Now, if you look at Nebraska's pivots, about 90% use groundwater. In Africa, it's exactly opposite. About 90% use surface water. And that's because in Africa, there's very little hydrological data to go by, and there's very little expertise in large diameter wells. But there's a lot of water there, and if you've ever stood at the mouth of the Congo or the mouth of the Niger, you see a tremendous amount of water going out to the ocean. And as we know, the ocean doesn't need any more water. And what I see is the wealth of Africa going into the ocean and not being utilized. This is a typical pivot that can be segmented into eight pieces. And what we've learned by some pilots with small, I'll hurry up, <laughs> with small holders, is that what you want to do is have them organize themselves as production units. And you may have seven or eight farm in one piece of pie and have their own rules of behavior. But another thing, there's no silver bullets to solve this problem in Africa. And there's no one organization that can solve the problem. Well, we've learned that you have to have a partnership between many organizations. And just bringing the pivot to the farmers doesn't solve the problem. You have to have the technology, which is the right hybrids, mechanization. Uh, you have to have finance for inputs and for the pivot. You have to have market linkage for the farmer and you have to have institutional support. You can also use this one well for domestic water purposes and for livestock feeding. So there's leverage to be gained there. You can have a wash facility at the edge of the field for the workers and for their families. Now we have nine projects going right now and they're all in different stages of implementation. The oldest ones are in Rwanda, where there's over 100 pivots being erected for smallholders now. And I'm just going to highlight one, which is one of the oldest, is Kagatumba in Rwanda, where the government bought 37 pivots for smallholders. And unfortunately, they didn't support the farmers as they should have. But we're correcting that situation now with the institutional support and financing and technical support. But it's going to be a great poster child for the concept because the produce they produce goes to a nutritional food factory which makes baby formula and nutritional products for children to combat stunting and, and malnutrition. Thank you. Martin Fisher is the co-founder and CEO of Kickstart International. And uh, Kickstart has a lot of experience. Thank you. I'm going to talk very quickly because I'm trying to get through two case studies here. Um, so when my slides come up here. Kickstart International is a non-profit social enterprise with a very simple mission, enable millions of people in Africa to climb out of poverty by earning a lot more money. And of course, with 80% of the poor in Africa being farmers, smallholder farmers, it turns out by far the best way for millions of them to get out of poverty is to move from rain-fed farming 
where they all grow at the same time, all harvest at the same time, flood the markets, they get very low prices as a result, and in fact, between 40 and 45% of the produce grown in Africa is spoiled before it's eaten or sold. Move from that to irrigated farming. With irrigated farming, you harvest all year round, and especially in those long dry seasons when there is no food, you get high value crops, you get highest prices right at the farm gate because at that time there's no other produce, and you might, as a result, get much lower crop loss. But only 4%, as we've heard, of sub-Saharan Africa is irrigated, and you get annual hungry seasons when the food is very expensive. 30% of the people are hungry, 35% of the under fives are stunted. There's a vibrant local demand, huge local demand for lower cost food in the hungry seasons. And that's what you can do and that's what you can feed when you irrigate. If you irrigate, on average, you're getting about two and a half times the yield, but you're getting about four times the income because of those higher prices, because of the higher value crops and the multiple harvests. So Kickstart said, what can we do for the very lowest cost solution for irrigation for millions of smallholders? And we launched a line of human-powered irrigation pumps called Moneymaker Pumps. This is our best-selling pump that we launched in 2000 called the Moneymaker Max. It can pull water from shallow wells up to seven and a half meters deep from also surface water and push it under pressure to a field for efficient pressurized hose pipe irrigation where you can actually take the water straight to the plants where you need it or spray it. Irrigates up to two acres if you irrigate a couple hours in the morning, a couple hours in the evening, and it retails, including all the hose pipes and the spares, for $160, which is still a lot for smallholders. So we also designed something we call the Moneymaker Hip Pump. Looks like a hand pump, but actually is operated with a rocking motion like this, and this can irrigate up to one and a quarter acres and retails again with hose pipes and spare parts for $90. We designed these so they're extremely strong and durable because they have to survive in very rural areas. They have to be completely easy to install, use, and maintain, repair without any tools. The farmer doesn't own tools and without any training. It has to be hugely energy efficient because it's manually operated. And we do thousands of hours of testing on every pump before we finalize the design. We establish a private sector supply chain. We used to mass produce these pumps in East Africa. We now actually produce them in China because it's cheaper and we export them into Africa and sell them through a network of local retail shops. So it's a sustainable supply chain. Everybody's making a margin slash profit from selling these pumps. But we're selling, as we know, to the very poorest, most risk averse farmers in the world who are living many, many kilometers off the road. And we're asking them to buy a brand new big ticket item and to change generations of farm practice. And this is a very, very big behavior change. This is not easy. Therefore, we do use donor funds, despite the profitable supply chain, to do a major marketing campaign. We had about 210 direct sales staff and farm-to-farm -farm demos, and this was in Kenya, Tanzania, and Mali. And so use donor funds, you have to measure the impact. On average, the farmers are going from making about $200 a year with either bucket irrigation or no irrigation at all um, to over $900 with irrigation of about 0.7 acres. So they're making $700 extra in new profits per year. And the great thing about this is this is smoothed out income across the year. So they can now have the confidence to invest in other things like livestock and improved um, farm inputs. So our impacts to date, and this was actually not to date, but this was from 2000 to July 2015. Um, by that time, we'd sold 270,000 pumps. We do a lot of impact monitoring. 200,000 families had successful farming businesses with these pumps, creating 180,000 jobs, $170 million in new profits and wages per year, um, literally lifting 1 million people, a major first step out of poverty, and producing the fruits and vegetables that are feeding all the needs of 10 million people. That was up to 2015, but that's not nearly enough for Africa. We need to scale massively beyond that. So to do that, we put together a new strategic plan to enable one million more people to climb out of poverty between 2015 and 2021. So accelerate dramatically the kind of progress we've been making on sales. To take a million people out of poverty, that's selling 270,000 pumps because not every pump lifts a family out of poverty, but we confidently can measure that 75% of those pumps do times five people per family. We wanted to do it in half the time, so we had to work differently than we had. So we pivoted from a Sorry. We pivoted from a retail sales model, this missed one slide here, um, to a partnership sales model. 
where instead of having our own retail staff out there, we now work through partners who are working on the ground with thousands of smallholder farmers and convince them to introduce irrigation into their programs, and that's very highly leveraged. We teach them about irrigation, we teach their farmers about irrigation, and we get, they have a very low marginal cost now because they have a trusted relationship with these farmers to get them to do their behavior change. And then we put in place a for-profit supply chain in all these countries where we sell to local importers, distributors who have a retail network of shops, putting in place a sustainable supply chain for the pumps and the spare parts and accessories. We said, where should we work? 16 highest potential countries across sub-Saharan Africa. And you can see here with three regional hubs in East, West, and Southern Africa. And it's a very cost-effective model. If you do it this way, 16 countries with only 53 sales staff. It's about $70 donor subsidy per pump sold. And this gives an ROI to the farmer over four years of 18 to 1, and to the donor of 40 to 1 um, over those four years. So very, very high ROI. And great, we can take another million people out of poverty by 2021, but guess what? Africa is going to grow by 200 million people by 2021. So unless we do something very different, we're still moving backwards between us just with all these numbers. So we have to find ways to develop and scale brand new solutions much more quickly. So we need new irrigation technologies to do this. We need new methods to enable take up of irrigation. And we need to increase participation of all the major stakeholders in irrigation. That's the only way to go forward through massive collaboration and innovation. One of the issues for a smallholder farmer is finance. How do they afford to get these pumps? So we have an innovative partnership we're doing with Vision Fund International, which is a mission-driven microfinance bank. Um, and they're working in 10 countries across sub-Saharan Africa. They target women with 72% of their loans, and they're targeting smallholder farmers. They're trying to get up to 70% of their loans to those smallholder farmers. But of course, lending to smallholder farmers is very risky for inputs because the rains are unreliable because of climate change. So it's very high risk, and they get a lot of defaults, which is why microfinance doesn't work very well in rural Africa. But with irrigation, you mitigate those risks because now you have an income all year long. Therefore, it's a fantastic first loan product for um, Vision Fund to loan to these farmers. So what does that product look like? Well, first we need a local NGO or partner who's actually organizing and working with those farmers as I described before. They mobilize the farmers, they introduce Kickstart, they introduce Vision Fund. Then we need a local shop which is selling the pumps, a local agrivet. And then Kickstart comes in, we demo the pumps to the farmers, we train the farmers, we train the partner staff, Vision Fund comes in, they qualify those farmers who want pumps, they put them into groups of five to 10, they give them the loans by buying the pumps from the retail shops and then collecting the loans from the farmers who repay. So, but it has to be customized beyond that. A loan product for irrigation to make it work, you can't compete with the rain-fed planting or school fees time of year. So they actually only offer this for the eight months to avoid the repayment on that, otherwise people won't repay. On top of that, they make a small down payment, and then you need a holiday, a three-month grace period, only paying interest, not repaying the loan, as you're waiting for your first harvest to come to fruition. And then you pay it off in six to nine months. So just a very quick story about a family. This family went from rain-fed maize farming to, with one of these loans, to growing tomatoes, cabbages, and greens. Um, weekly harvest, once they came to harvest. In the first 10 months, they made $910 profit. Okay, of course, they paid back their loan, they sent two kids to school, and now they're buying two cows, all within the first 10 months. So it's transformational. This is the kind of impact we see with irrigation. Where are we? In Zambia, we started with 500 loans in the first year, 1250 in the second year. We're doing 3,000 loans this year. 98% repayment rates, much, much higher than you get for normal agricultural lending. Um, and we now have an MOU to scale to Ghana, Tanzania, Malawi, and Rwanda. So that's that case study. But in fact, we also need new technology. So we're innovating here, a very low cost pump. I told you our previously lowest cost pump was $90. This is $45, a starter pump. Uh, we're launching this into the market in September. We already have field tests out there. But solar irrigation is also going to be big going forward. We need the world's lowest cost, most efficient solar irrigation pump. And that's what we're working to develop now. A flat pack irrigation pump portable, plug and play. You can't leave your irrigation pump in the field. You have to carry it down every day, including the panels. Um, a flexible design, it's a submersible pump. It can go down a two inch tube well, but also into a muddy pond. Um, patented modular design, which allows this pump to be scaled up to 20 meters head. 
A maximum efficiency at the base unit of 7.5 meters head can irrigate half an acre in three to four hours, and a final retail price of $150. So how do you develop a pump like this? You have to partner with the right people. In our case, we're partnering with a group called NCAP Technologies. This is the world's biggest producer of brushless DC pumps for the automobile industry in America. They sell millions of these pumps. They can produce an extremely efficient pump for about $5 to $10. Um, so you combine that technology um, with the most efficient um, brushless DC pump uh, motor, and you have this. We're going to launch this in about a year from now. Technology development takes time, even with the great partners. So thank you, and That was great. You also helped us to save time. <laughs> Next is Meredith Giordiano of International Water Management Institute. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, yes, my name is Meredith Giordano. I'm with EMI. I'm based in Washington, D.C. And actually, I'll be presenting today on behalf of some of my colleagues who have been working on uh, solar pump irrigation, looking at the feasibility and suitability of solar pump irrigation in Ethiopia. So I'm building on now uh, on what, what we've just heard. So this feasibility study was built um, with, oh dear. Hmm, this is an old version of the, oh well, I'll just go with it. <laughs> this is the old version of the presentation. Anyhow, um, this, this feasibility study was built on uh, literature reviews, interviews, uh, economic and biophysical modeling, and case and uh, piloting of one of the business models that was carried out uh, um, over 2015 and 2016. Um, it looked at both groundwater resources as well as surface water resources. What we found is that it is economically feasible, um, the, the business model that we, we did uh, pilot, and I'll come back to that in a minute, that women prefer and often benefit more from this business model because it can be used for multiple purposes, because uh, you can irrigate vegetables and, and um, it reduces labor, um, it can improve uh, nutrition, and it can provide steady income to farmers. Um, yeah, and it can provide additional revenue sources in terms of uh, uh, charging batteries for mobile phones or for other purposes. Okay. So actually this map is a little bit similar to what you saw over lunchtime. They looked at the suitability of introducing uh, solar, pump business, uh, solar pumps uh, for irrigation in Ethiopia. They looked at groundwater sources, um, proximity to surface water resources, um, as well as access to road networks and market networks. And they found for Ethiopia as a whole, up to about 7 million hectares have significant potential uh, for introducing solar pump irrigation in Ethiopia, with significant potential in the regions of Amhara, Oromia, and SNNPR. There are a number of conditions that make it favorable for investment. First of all, the demand is high. There's a lot of demand, as we've just heard, for more sol solar power irrigation from both men and women. There's potential market in, the, uh, in these suitable areas that were identified for selling crops, for selling produce produced with solar irrigation. And there are market entry points um, through a number of um, high value commodities already in place, for example, coffee, that already have very well established value chains uh, and have credit uh, already set up for farmers. There are a number of policies that are already in place that are supportive of this, this move towards solar power irrigation in Ethiopia. And in effect, the, the government is looking to transform the, the 200,000 plus pump users already towards solar pump irrigation in Ethiopia in the coming years. So there's huge potential and there's huge demand. There are tax and tariff incentives. The, the, the um, tariff has come down, the customs duty has come down to zero. Uh, to incentivize suppliers, distributors, and farmers themselves to, to purchase this, uh, this uh, technology. And there's potential for more private sector investment and policies in place to enhance that potential. Already, there's a number of donor and uh, public sector funded projects to introduce solar pump irrigation in Ethiopia. 
So there's a lot of traction. But there are some key constraints, and many of them have already been identified so far. And many of these constraints are hindering farmer investment and other forms of private sector investment in solar irrigation in Ethiopia. This includes, um, while I said there's an enabling environment, it's often very difficult to navigate through the regulations and incentive systems. And so to access those tax breaks can be difficult. And that's our, our research group actually found that when they were trying to to pilot this particular case study. The value chain is still in an infancy, so it's gonna take some time for that to, to develop. The pumps and the parts are imported, um, so the domestic production potential needs to be built up. Um, rural financing is limited. Again, a key constraint that we hear over and over again, and this is a particular concern for women who cannot ac access uh, forms of credit. And the capacity to install, to service, and to re repair this form of technology is still in its, in its infancy. Our, um, our research team looked at what, what could be some business scenarios to bring the private sector more into play, and what are some to, to bring this, this, this potential into fruition, to bring farmers and other private sector players into part of this investment opportunity. They looked at three different opportunities that have been uh, uh, used in other parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, and they tested one of them, um, this individual farmer-owned uh, scenario where a solar pump would be purchased by a farmer for use both for agriculture as well as for household use. The other ones that were looked at were outgrowers, where an outgrower company would uh, pre-finance a solar, uh, a solar uh, pump for farmers. Even insurance companies might want to do that to, to reduce risk for farmers. And as well as solar pump producer or distributor supplying uh, uh, to, to sell or to lease to farmers using different types of, types of financing techniques. So they looked at those, but they, we haven't yet had a chance to pilot those. So what we found was um, that the pump cost in this case is about $350 if no taxes uh, or tariffs are, are included, uh, plus installation, and this assumes that there's already a shallow well existing. The minimum required plot size is between 700 and 950 square meters, which is well within the, the average plot size of Ethiopia, so that, that part is suitable. And what they found was that the return on investment, depending on the type of water application system that was used, depending on the interest rate, and depending on the crop that was irrigated, ranged between $1,600 and about $5,600 per hectare, and a positive benefit cost ratio in all the different scenarios that were looked at. So maybe just to, to conclude, um, some reflections on where we might take this next. There's, there's high potential for this, there's promise, there's already a lot of investment going on with the public sector and donors to encourage this. Um, there's, there's high demand by farmers, both men and women, to, to gain access to solar irrigation in Ethiopia. There's an enabling environment. But there are some key constraints we need to think about in terms of gender and equity, institutions, uh, financing, and sustainability of, of upscaling this type of solution. We need to make sure that women and rural poor can access credit in order to, to, gain, to, to purchase or to, or to lease this form of technology. We need, there, there needs to be improvements in, in information about the tax and incentive systems that do exist already. There need to be institutional arrangements that are supportive for this more dispersed form of irrigation where it's not a collectivized form, but it's more dispersed. And in that vein, thinking about the sustainability of upscaling, um, uh, of unchecked upscaling of this type of, of technology. We've seen what's happened in India when there's been upscaling through incentives through subsidized electricity and more recently subsidized uh, solar technology in terms of drawdowns in groundwater because of the incentives to, to pump. So that needs to be considered when we go forward in terms of uh, in terms of scaling up this. So it, for our next steps, we'd like to further look into these different business scenarios and their opportunities for scaling up in Ethiopia to, to, dis, to figure out which model or models could support smallholder farmers, both men and women, profitably and productively uh, enhance their irrigation or irrigated agriculture in a sustainable way. Thank you. Thank you, Meredith. 
And I think next is Ruth Mezendik from IFPRI. Thank you. What I'm going to be talking about is, um, builds quite a bit on what Rob was talking about at lunchtime. If we're going to talk about inclusive um, irrigation or agricultural growth, then a big dimension of that is the gender dimension. There's often a, what I call the farmer in the Dell syndrome. Those of you who know the nursery rhyme, the farmer takes a wife, the wife takes a child. Whereas, in fact, many of those farmers are themselves wives <laughs> and women. So we need to get over that notion. There are a lot of both donor programs and even NGO and other programs that say they're going to do this. What I'm going to look at is one mechanism to actually help make sure that happens. So the case study I'm talking about is not about a technology. It draws on the Innovation Lab for Small Scale Irrigation, or ILC, that Rob mentioned at lunch, um, led by Texas A&M, but it's part of the Feed the Future Innovation Labs. And it's been looking at, uh, collaborative with EMI and, and other organizations, looking at various types of irrigation technologies that are being rolled out in Ethiopia, um, Tanzania, and Ghana. Most of these technologies are used for vegetables, irrigated fodder, kitchen gardens. Um, but what, we're, what I'm going to be talking about is, is not the technologies themselves, but the gender dimensions of this. So IFPRI, as part of this project, is studying the um, collecting household and intra-household survey data about this on the links between the small-scale irrigation, nutrition, health, and the women's empowerment. As part of that, what we are using is the Women's Empowerment in Agriculture Index, which was developed, if we uh, co-developed it with USAID and OFI to, as part of the Feed the Future, as part of the monitoring and evaluation framework. The reason for that was USAID said, we have said inclusive agricultural growth is part of our objective, but we're also going to be monitoring, and if we don't have indicators on the inclusive part, people are just gonna focus on the growth part that's easier to measure and often easier to achieve. So they wanted real indicators of, of the women's empowerment aspects of this. So within that, we have five domains of empowerment. Um, women's control over uh, or participation in decision making on production, access to productive resources and control over those productive resources, control over income, community leadership, largely group membership, and time. Because a lot of development projects targeting women actually increase their time burden, which may have negative Im implications for children's nutrition, for example as well as for women's own well-being. So within this, we also have a, we collect the data from both women and men, and then we look at the gender parity between the two. So scale from zero to one. Um, now within ILSI, we developed an adaptation of that that specifically focuses on a lot of the things that are important to irrigation. Um, here are some of the results. Um, these are actually relatively high scores on the Women's Empowerment in Ag Index. Um, in Ethiopia, you see that, that WEA scores are actually slightly higher for non-irrigators than for irrigators. What this allows you to do is look at what are the greatest contributors to disempowerment, and then you can design your projects so that they address those areas of deficiency in the local area of what are the things that most disempower women. Uh, do you need to address credit access or um, group membership? A big one, a really big thing to consider is when you are talking about value chain development, are you giving away control over that 
from women who, have off, who may be controlling the produce if it is used for home consumption to men who often control the income if it's taken to the market. And so this, this allows you to think about that consistently. Do women gain or lose control over income uh, with these projects? Um, the benefit of the, the tool is that it provides a, as both a snapshot of this um, and helps you diagnose what are the contributors to disempowerment, which can be very different from one context to another, even within a country. Then you can use that to, to design interventions that address those def deficiencies or areas of disempowerment, as well as to track your progress. Because there are lots of gender screening tools out there, but often those don't get used unless there's accountability for them. By creating some accountability, this really increases the, the incentive to address this. There are really remarkable cases in Bangladesh, for example, which in the initial screening had the highest disempowerment of, any, of women of any of the countries in the Feed the Future. They designed programs to address that, and there's really remarkable improvements in the way of scores in Bangladesh. So we are, I, the, the surveys alone are not if enough. Ideally, you want to com combine this with qualitative work, and we are doing that now in developing a project level um, uh, WEA or pro WEA that is supported by USAID and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So you can stay tuned for the results on that. We should have something uh, ideally by the end of this year on how that looks. Um, the positive factors have been that, it, it, as I've mentioned, you can, it's pretty easy to use. There's been a lot of interest by donors as well as other organizations. So we now have over 60 organizations in 39 countries using this. Um, and it provides evidence for people who want to, to champion women's empowerment, and you can then compare the women's empowerment scores with other outcomes like nutritional improvements. It is somewhat costly to implement, so we're looking at ways of cutting that back, and it doesn't substitute for good qualitative work. However, we um, find some positive signs from combining the two. So thank you very much. The lady seems to be able to keep to time. <laughs> That's very good. Um, next speaker is Sitembele Mwamakamba from the Food, Agriculture, and Natural Resource Policy Analysis Network, Southern Africa. Thank you. Um, mine is actually a pretty easy job because I'm building on what I presented on um, in the morning. I'm just going to then focus on specific components that have been successful in the project that we have worked on. So quickly again, um, I think in the morning I didn't mention the duration of the project. So it has been going on since 2013 and um, the first phase ends on June 2017. But the Australian Center for International Agriculture Research, which is our key funder, has seen the successes and they are funding the project again for another four years. So we'll be starting the second phase from July. We have about three Australian partners and five African um, partners. Uh, well, ICRISAT, the Lawai office is the one that's the African partner, although we know that they are a global institution. And the sites again are in Mozambique, Tanzania, and Zimbabwe. Um, maybe just to emphasize uh, the target beneficiaries that we are working with, since I, I touched on um, the approach in the morning, we are working with about 5,000 smallholder irrigator households in the six irrigation areas in the three countries where we are working. And the project models adaptive learning and innovation platform approach with government and non-government um, organizations. So to focus on uh, the three features of the, of the project that I would like to present as a, as a case study, 
The first element is on the agriculture innovation platforms where farmers are able to identify the barriers that I presented this morning. And they can also engage with different stakeholders who can contribute to the solutions um, when they are invited. Then we also have the wetting front dictator tools that have been introduced to the farmers to help them measure their water penetration into the soil and to help them make decisions on when and how to, to irrigate their plots. The other element is looking at monitoring the soil solution for nitrates and fertility within the soil so that the farmers are able to then decide if they should add fertilizer, if they, uh, so that they're able to make decisions on what steps to take um, in their fields. So in terms of the factors that have uh, hindered the success, I think the biggest one is the public land tenure system, especially in, um, in Zimbabwe, where farmers do not own the land. And we have had situations whereby within the scheme, you have some plots that have not been um, worked on that are uh, uh, that don't have anything on them. So even if the farmers that are currently actively involved in the scheme would want to sort of develop, they still have a problem where you have plots whose owners have relocated somewhere else, but because they don't own that land and they don't have much say, they cannot make any decisions uh, around that. Some of the factors, I touched on them in the morning in terms of poor water management, the high input and transport costs, as well as the weak links to the, to the markets. So this is uh, where I really want to uh, focus on, on how the um, innovation platform system, we have seen it really working for the farmers that we are working. I have two cases, one in Zimbabwe and another one in Tanzania. In Tanzania, we have seen that um, for the longest time, the extension workers that are working with the irrigators uh, we are working with on the project, they were emphasizing on farmers growing maize, maize. but clearly it was not um, profitable for the farmers. So through the AIP system, the farmers were able to engage with the extension workers, but they were also able to sort of get support from other development um, agencies that were working around the area. Um, institutions like Ukrasat were able to work with the farmers to develop um, cost-benefit analysis, to look at the gross margins, and to finally come to a conclusion that growing maize is just not profitable. And from those discussions, we have seen a change where farmers are now moving to uh, growing uh, peanuts, some are growing garlic, and they have target um, markets that they are growing those products for. So there's been that change because of the AIP systems that the project was able to facilitate. In the case of uh, Tanzania, uh, through the AIP system, we have come to a point where the farmers that we are working with have been able to get certificates of customary occupants. They now have papers that they can produce and take to credit um, institutions to say, I have this plot, can I borrow so, so much money? And because of that, they have been able to, to get access to credit. They have also, because of the customary occupation certificates, they've been also been able to make decisions on the fees that they collect from the members of the scheme, and they've been able to follow up on that. They've managed as well to increase the maintenance that goes into the, the canals where they are, um, where uh, that pass through their, their plots. So we have seen some some pretty good, I mean, positive uh, successes that we believe are now scalable. And as we go into phase two, we'll be looking to see how we can make sure that these successes we have seen in these particular two schemes in Slalachana in Zimbabwe, as well as in Kiwere, can be, the lessons can be shared to other irrigation schemes. Thank you. Last but not least is Timothy. Privet, the CEO of IDA. Thank you, my fellow Tim. <laughs> nice to see you here. Okay, um, and that's a tough act to follow. That was very succinct and quick. I hope I can be just as quick and succinct. 
So our farm business advisors I mentioned yesterday uh, in the keynote address, and I thought I would take this opportunity to go in a little bit more depth on how the systems work and what kind of results we're getting out of it, both financial and in terms of impact. But before I do, let me start with some of the why we did this work. The why we did this is based on, in part, what I read about in an IFPRI study about six years ago, which said that for a farmer to buy irrigation equipment, the most expensive part of the transaction is actually research and learning about the product or products because it takes so much time for the farmer to get out there and learn about it and it's just not in their backyard. In many cases they're not, they don't have ex multiple examples of irrigation there. And that, that saying, when you look at supply chains in Sub-Saharan Africa, that saying, if you build a better mousetrap, the world will beat a path to your door. Nothing could be further from the truth. It's just, the, the, imagine some new and interesting products that are launched here in the U.S. So much money goes into marketing and promotion of any, and there's huge upfront costs, and then later costs, they finally get more inexpensive and, and, and affordable. Okay, so, and then added to the complexity of ag systems, you know, one size did not fit all, even in Zambia, which I'll talk about, what works in this region of the country may not work in another region of the country. And finally, the lack of sales points. And you can buy a Coca-Cola or a mobile scratch card in the smallest villages in Africa, but if you want to get, you know, five types of seeds and some fertilizer, good luck. It's really a, a much different market than we're used to here. Okay, so with all that in mind, let me go through some of the basics of this program very quickly. I'm going to show you data that goes actually up to 2014. We're still working through some of the last two years' data, which you see here. And our most recent partner is, is CETA, and we have several locations in Zambia. So what do FBAs do? As I mentioned yesterday, this is a trust-based sales model. So you're, uh, if you're a farm business advisor, typically you're, you're female and in your village, you are selling uh, products and services to your neighbors. And on your own farm, you are known as an early adopter. So maybe you're growing with drip irrigation, you're growing with new seeds, new fertilizer, you're trying things out. And as you try things out, you feed that data back into the central system so that in new years, new products come out through the different farm business agents. There's also a lot of output marketing that happens more in Mozambique than in Zambia, but that just goes to show you the difference in the different countries and different approaches. And then there's also services provided. There's often a little bit of training. It's not a full extension services service, but it does have some elements of training. Typically, the farm business advisor wants to train the others. Here's some data that's really interesting. We track this on almost all of our efforts, and this is our total cost, everything, to deliver services through this model. So when we first started in 2011, the cost per beneficiary was huge, $2,800. And that's how much it costs to cover central office, absolutely every bit of the cost. Well, what's exciting is that by the end of 2014, and this was very quick for us, we got to a break-even point. And I'll tell you why. That's $195 per client. So the number of clients went up so far that our effectiveness with this covered the cost of actually doing business. So some features, the power of farm business advisors, it's cost effective, it's sustainable, it's scalable. Uh, on average, globally, 132 people are served by one farm business advisor. That's a little high for our taste. We're actually trying to get that down because that shows the level of service. You can only serve so many people before the level of the quality goes down. And then globally, we're at more than 340000 at this point uh, and an average income of $423 uh, going up. And this is the, the bullets at the bottom are specific to Zambia, so you can take a look at that case. And Again, $201, and that's our break-even point because for the total global cost of the program, it's $196, so we're just above, which is nice. And we have some new data coming for the past two years which shows additional investment to strengthen the system, and so the costs kind of go down, and then they're going back up again, so we're, and we're getting even more clients in. 
And then 200 farm business advisors, we're actually at 240 now, earning 2.4 million, million kwacha. Um, data feedback is absolutely essential to get good tracking of, of what's working on the farms, be it a drip irrigation system or a type of seed or some fertilizer, getting that information back so then what's sold next year. Remember these are mostly annual crops so you get a chance to, to re-up on, uh, on the service offering. Access to credit has been a huge challenge and you know just the demand and the acceleration of, of what people want to buy versus the ability to credit, it's just not there yet. Uh, and then, of course, getting the right people, getting the right people to become a farm business advisor in training. And I put a little, little graph there on what makes a great farm business advisor. We're constantly working through that. And then scalable, just get the equation right. Get it so that farm business advisors make money. Like all value chain efforts, you know, if people make money in the system, it grows and it multiplies. And if they don't, then it breaks down. So you have to look very carefully at what is the farmer earning, what is the farm business advisor earning, and what, is, what are the seed companies earning, what are the fertilizer companies earning. Everybody's got a profit in the change. And then it becomes a virtuous cycle, and it grows and expands uh, in a country. And just to close, uh, we're, really, we're very proud of this effort. We won the Nestle Shared Value Prize for it. And uh, a long time ago, actually, before I joined IDE, I was a judge on the World Bank Development Marketplace, and that year, the system won the, the Development Marketplace Award. We have a Harvard business case on it as well, and I look forward to seeing how it grows and develop through the years. Thank you very much. Thank you to all the case study presenters. This brings us to the end of the first part of the session. We will take a break now and reconvene in the banquet hall at 3.15 to continue the second session. Please reserve all your questions. Come back to this uh, second segment of the session and you will have time to answer your questions. Thank you so much for your participation. <laughs>